Well, Mark and I are still at Green Lake in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. It's still cold. And uh, you can hear water birds and ducks around us, I assume. And we want to talk about quantificational logic in this session. So, uh, quantificational logic is a whole new branch of logic that encompasses the logic of Aristotle that dealt with categorical reasoning, plus the logic of truth functions, originally started by the Stoic uh, philosophers of ancient Greece. And it is a more powerful system than either of those two systems of logic. It encompasses, it encompasses both of them. We want to start with translation. We're assuming that you've read some of the course material and we're just kind of uh, hitting a few high points here and in doing this to stimulate you to get into the material. I want to translate some sentences. So from the perspective of quantificational logic, we, we want to say that every sentence is either singular or general. A singular sentence is the sentence that says something about one specifically identified thing, <clears throat> and a general sentence is any sentence that's not singular. So we start with the singular, two singular sentences. So a singular sentence has a subject and a predicate, as you know. The subject part of the sentence tells us what the sentence is about. It picks out uh, what the sentence is going to be saying something about. The predicate part says something about that which the subject part refers to or identifies. In a singular sentence, the subject part is always a singular term. A singular term is a term that refers to or denotes or picks out or singles out one specifically identified thing. There are two kinds of singular terms. Uh, one kind of singular term is called a proper name. John F. Kennedy, Barack Obama, uh, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, these are proper names. A proper name is a, single, is a singular term because it singles out or picks out or identifies one specific thing by naming it. A, a second type of singular term is called a definite description. A definite description picks out or singles out one specifically identified thing by, by describing it exactly. So we start here with the sentence, Susan is happy. It counts as a singular sentence because its subject term refers to or denotes or picks out one specifically identified thing. This sentence does it with using a, a proper name, Susan. So the, the subject term of this sentence is a proper name, Susan. The predicate is over here. Now, again, the predicate says something about that which the subject refers to. So the subject tells us this is about Susan, and, it, and about her it says she's happy. Now, how would you symbolize Susan is happy, Mark? Well, when we have the individual, or specifically the name, persons, places, or things, we use lowercase letters. A, B, C, all the way up through, but not including the variable letters, like mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. The predicates are, are going to get a uppercase letter, a capital letter, so capital H, for instance. And the way we do this, it's not really based on English. Uh, we have capital H and a small s. That means Susan is happy, so you can write that down if you wish. Capital H, small s. In that order. In that order. And the order may look a little different from what you're used to if you're used to speaking English, but again, this is an international system. And it takes all 30 seconds to get used to. So Susan is happy. If you want to say Susan is not happy, you can put a tilde there. And it is not the case that Susan is happy. So uh, S is called an individual constant. constant. A constant is a symbol that stands for one specific thing. And a variable is a symbol that ranges over a domain that stands for anything from a domain of things. Uh, and so this is a constant because it stands for one specific thing. In fact, it's an individual constant and it's called an individual constant because it stands for or symbolizes a singular term. And so the singular term is Susan. And so S is standing for the singular term Susan. 
technically this would be Susan Brown or some full proper name. And then the H is called a predicate constant and it stands for the predicate phrase is happy. So this just says Susan is happy. Okay. Now we have a singular sentence here. Why is it singular? You know, it's referring to a specific thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the tallest man it doesn't have a name, Bob or Jim, uh, but there's only one tallest man on earth. So we know we're talking about a very specific demarcated individual. Mm -hmm. So we might use a small t for that. Mm -hmm. So is Y is the predicate, capital W, then a small t. So okay. the tallest man on earth is Y. This is the constant, that's the predicate. Very similar to this, start, start off with the predicate, and then off to the right is going to be the subject of the sentence. So we always put the predicate constant first and the subject term, subject constant second. So the T stands for the definite description, the tallest man on earth. Mm -hmm. And that counts as a definite description because it picks out one uniquely identified, one specifically identified entity by, by describing it precisely. And so there's only one. and that makes that a singular term, so we put a T for the tallest man on earth. We use a letter that reminds us of the expression it stands for, don't we? Yeah. And, then the, and then the capital W is for, for the predicate phrase, is wise. And these could actually be the same letter. If this was the tallest man on earth is terrified, uh -huh. you could still have a capital T, small t, and that's mm -hmm. okay because it makes a difference if you're using uppercase or lowercase. So there's no confusion in having a statement that was translated capital T, small t. Tallest man on earth is terrified. Okay, so for the tallest man on earth we use? Um, small t. Small t. For and is terrified? Uppercase T. Uppercase T. Mm -hmm. So this stands for the predicate, this stands for the subject. Mm -hmm. so no, we, that is a lowercase T. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have uh, translated a, two singular sentences into our system. Now let's translate some general sentences. So a sentence is singular if its subject term picks out or singles out or where'd you go, Mark? <laughs> I'm back. Singles out one specifically identified thing, either by naming it or by a definite description of it. A general sentence is any sentence that's not singular, but there are two types of general sentences that we'll talk about. One is called a universal general sentence, and the other is called an existential general sentence, also called a particular general sentence. So a, a universal general sentence says something about all the members of a group. An existential general sentence, or a particular general sentence, says something about some of the members of a group, where some means one or more, or at least one. So we want to symbolize, for instance, suppose someone says all things in the entire universe are good. Very optimistic person. This is, yeah, this is a total optimist. Okay. They think everything in the universe is okay. good. There's nothing bad. Bad doesn't exist. Everything's good. We got it. So we want to symbolize this in quantificational logic and we're assuming you've studied the materia, the basic idea, but Mark, do you want to just talk about how you symbolize well, this? I'm looking at it and I see it's not a singular sentence. It's not making a claim about a specifically named person or described person. Right. It's more general. It's universal. Uh -huh. It's not a claim about every single a member in a group and the group is the entire universe. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a universal statement. The main connective is going to be the universal quantifier. Mm -hmm. It might use an X, mm -hmm. could be a Y or a Z. Uh, in this case, it's saying for all things, for everything that exists, they're good. So is good is going to be the predicate. For all things, that thing is good. Everything's good. Everything. It doesn't have to be a true statement or a false statement, but I can translate it either way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so when you look at this formula, this is the universal quantifier. And this is read as for every X or for all X. And then this is what this expression is called an open sentence by itself. The expression uh, GX by itself is called an open sentence, as you know. X is a variable that holds the place for where a subject term would be put. 
and then G is the predicate constant, standing for a predicate phrase. So G, G is the predicate is good. X is a variable, so this X is good. X just marks a spot where a subject term would go. So what we have then is we have a subject term and a predicate term in effect. This is, can be understood as the subject of the sentence, and this can be understood as the predicate. So the subject says, hey you, I'm going to say something about everything in the universe, every X in the universe, where X is anything in the universe. And then this part is the predicate that says something about each of those things, namely, it's good. So this X is like a relative pronoun referring back to this X. And this universal quantifier, in effect, distributes this predicate expression onto everything in the universe. In fact, you could think of the universal quantifier as a function that distributes the predicate phrase onto everything in the universe, if you wished. So this just says for everything in the universe, this. It's good. Okay. So now let's try something else. How about all cats are mammals? How do you want to say that in quantified logic? Well, again, I'm seeing immediately that it's a universal statement because it's making a claim about every single member of a group. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a universal statement. That means I start off with a universal quantifier. So I know I have that. This will be my main connective again. Mm -hmm. The statement is about cats. That's the subject of the statement here. So what I'd be saying is, for all things, if that thing is a cat, then that very same thing is a mammal. And I want to make sure both these variables are bound by the quantifier, so I put that in parentheses. This would be a pretty standard looking affirmative universal statement. Um, for all things, for everything that exists, if that thing, and you can just be pointing to anything, that air molecule, this piece of paper, this jacket, whatever you're pointing to in the universe, if that thing's a cat, then that thing is a mammal. And as long as everything you point to in the entire universe, if it's a cat, then it's a mammal, that makes sure every single cat in the world is going to be a mammal. All cats are mammals. And that, I think, is what we're doing for right now.